Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. I'm ashamed to be a black guy. 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 I'm ashamed to be In this country, in 15 or 20 years' time, the black man will have the whip hand over the white man. I've just been rereading Enoch Powell, The Rivers of Blood speech. His prophecy was absolutely right in one sense. The Tiber didn't foam with blood, but flames lambent, wrapped round Tottenham and wrapped round Clapham. But it wasn't into communal violence. This is where he was completely wrong. What's happened is that a substantial section of the chads that you wrote about have become black. The whites have become black, a particular sort of violent, destructive, nihilistic gangster culture. This is what happens when a fear of the police evaporates. However, the IPCC have made clear their findings thus far now, I think last night, there is no question that this was an execution to start killing. They are feral rats, feral rats. The mobs were feral, feral rats. I saw, a, you know, an image of a boy, you know, a black boy making a white boy strip in the street. To me, those things are reprehensible. And those people should have more than the book thrown at them. His prophecy was absolutely right. I'm ashamed to be a black guy seeing a lot of young other black, black people causing this trouble and bringing our names down. Alrighty, context of white supremacy. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, we had some, I had some problems with the phone line, uh, got things worked out, um, thankfully. So we are all good to go. Um, I uh, tried to explain that, but my line was muted earlier. <laughs> it was uh, rough getting going, but we got it together. Uh, this broadcast um, had several folks, Non Mighty Wick, uh, Pumpkin down in California, who uh, remembered the film when we had Dr. William Les Henry, who was just in that audio clip as well. Uh, he was on the program, and he mentioned the documentary film, uh, Blood uh, Go Run. And folks were very interested in hearing more about the film. They wanted to check it out. Uh, and I think it, it, there was even more interest, interest once the riots began last summer in the United Kingdom. And... Uh, I was able to get contact information for the black male who produced the film, and uh, he was willing to come share some of his time, uh, explain more about uh, the films that he's done, uh, as well as his views on what's been going on in the United Kingdom of late with the rioting this past summer, as well as the recent uh, decision around Stephen Lawrence. Uh, as I said, independent filmmaker, uh, he did the film Blood, Ah, uh, Go, Run, uh, as well as more recently, 2011, The Story of Lover's Rock, uh, excellent documentary uh, showcasing black musicians, specific, uh, specifically uh, black reggae artists uh, in the UK. Uh, real pleasure to have him on the program with us, uh, Mr. Menelik Shabazz. Mr. Shabazz, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you for having me. 
Thank you. The pleasure is ours, sir. Um, for I guess for any of our listeners who might not be familiar with your work, this might be their first time hearing from you. Could you give us some of your background information that might be more helpful as we proceed with the discussion? Okay. Yes. Um, I've been working as an independent filmmaker in the UK for the last 30 years, and in that time, I've produced um, films. For um, Channel 4, BBC, ITV, um, and I've directed a, a movie um, known as Burning an Illusion, which is what I'm best known by. And the film has been distributed in the US for over two decades. Um, I also did, um, and that film won an award um, at one of the um, the Amiens Film Festival. Um, and I also did a film called Catch a Fire for the BBC Two, which won an award at National Black Programming Consortium um, in the US um, about the story of Paul Bogle, the um, national hero of Jamaica, who led the Moran Bay Rebellion in 1865. Um, that won an award, and I've done other films like um, Time and Judgment, which have been screened on national TV, um, Dada Goran, which you've mentioned, was a newsreel piece um, that I did that was in the height of 1981 when we had um, um, the, um, the fire that killed 13 young black people, um, which kind of really was a, because uh, we in the community felt it was a racist attack. And, um, and so that galvanized us to have a Black People's Day of Action march which um, brought together, I think, about 25, 20, 30,000 black people on the streets of London. Um, and um, the, I documented that, film, um, the, the march, and then after the march, within, what, two, three months, we had the riots in, in, in Brixton and other parts. So the film kind of documents the, uh, the march and... The, um, the 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 riots that happened and that um, following because eighty one was a very volatile year um, so so Badagaran was 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 that film um, which I believe is is housed in the Schomburg Museum um, in New York they've had a copy for many years of the film um, and um, uh, yeah and I took a break of filmmaking because I got frustrated and then began to, um, I organized a film festival, the BFM International Film Festival, and also produced a publication called Black Filmmaker Magazine, which was, um, I produced uh, both for the for eight, nine, ten years. I took a break, and then I've come back recently with the story of Lover's Rock, which is really about um, what we can probably talk about at later. Um, you know, um, which is a genre of reggae that was created in the UK that was um, uh, allowed us to express our romantic sides and it also provided healing uh, because it came out in the same time of the, we're talking about the riots and just prior to that when we were as black British people um, born here or who came from the Caribbean were feeling the brunt of racism, police brutality, and so on. And this music allowed us to heal. So, you know, um, so that was Lover's Rock in a way. And it became a global a global um, name by people like Maxi Priest and later on people like UB40 and other people kind of took it on. And Sade had an album called Lover's Rock, which all kind of came out this whole influence. Wow. Right on. Right on. Okay. Um, well, and we certainly, I want to go into more detail about uh, different films and some of the things that have been happening in the UK. Um, I wanted to, I guess, begin uh, this program, uh, what I believe is responsible for the fire in New Cross in 1981, uh, what they were talking about for most of last summer with the riots around the murder of Mark Duggan. Uh, racism, white supremacy. Um, I believe that we are in a global system dominated by racism, white supremacy. I use those two terms as synonyms. 
and I yeah. use uh, the same definition for both terms. I want to give you my definition and see if you think it makes sense. Um, my definition, a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, do you think that is an accurate definition? Do you think such a system exists? I, uh, yes, definitely. Um, I think it exists and it's run by very few people that are at the, uh, the pyramid of, of the system. And I agree with you, yes, it's a very calculated system um, that is there to, um, to create disorder wherever uh, um, um, people of color are and to en empower themselves and to, um, and to create a system which is based on um, greed, based on darkness in terms of negativity, um, and a system that is based on destabilizing all other cultures from their center. And, um, and, and, and so doing, then reduce them to, um, a, um, to a situation where they are not in a position to, to move forward. Um, and that's, you know, so what you're saying, yeah, is I agree with that, yes. Right on, right on. Um, I think it would be important. You were born in Barbados and migrated yes. to the UK. Um, can you talk about how, how, or I guess number one, what age did you migrate to the UK? Well, I was part of the typical journey of um, migrants in the Caribbean. My dad had left, um, you know, five years before to go to. Um, the UK to get a better life because you know the colonial system in Barbados as elsewhere provided nothing for the people and so they always had to go out and go to other places um, previous generation went to the Panama Canal my dad previously went to Miami, uh, Florida to work on the sugar plantations and so on and so after the war when the um, uh, Britain was destroyed uh, they needed cheap labor to come in and to work, and so they call on the colonies um, to come in, especially in the Caribbean. And so my dad went to the UK, and as with most, he then sent for us. Um, I was, what, six years old or so, he sent for my mother and my sister, and we came. So that kind of was the trend at the time. Wow, wow, okay. And... I mean, I think that was a big part of what was going on in 1981, Blood I Go Run, and a lot of the events that happened around um, those incidents. And even before, uh, the Rivers of Blood yeah. speech with Enoch Powell was about people like yeah, you. I mean, we, that's right. We came in, I came in the 60s, I should mention. I came in the 60s. So um, that was a different time. That was a time when our parents were the ones that carried the brunt of the discrimination. I mean, they they had to deal with situations where, you know, of um, having to do menial jobs, even though they were skilled, in higher skill, but they weren't given those tasks. They had to deal with, um, you know, um, poor um, housing. You know, we would have signs in the windows where people would say, no Irish, no coloreds, no dogs or they may be just no colleagues or, you know, so it was, you know, discrimination was just in your face. And then, of course, you had to deal with all the racist groups um, at the time, you know, um, that the Teddy Boys and so on who used to roam the streets. And um, there was a famous case in 1958 where Kelson Cochran in, in was killed, um, which was a kind of another watershed moment in kind of British racial history. Um, and there was a major funeral in March, and um, and that was, as I said, um, a point which brought to light the 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 kind of um, not just 
the discrimination in terms of jobs and housing and so on, but the physical um, um, situation of, of, of um, racism and brutality that was meted out to our parents and who stood firm and who kind of braved that. And um, we were the ones that, were the, that went into the education system. We were the ones that saw the, um, the system, um, we call it the Babylon system, for the, you know, as it is, because we went to school with other um, English children. We saw the class system. We saw the racism in terms of how we were dealt with. We saw um, that we were outsiders. And, um, and then we saw that the plantation system, which we had kind of left, although we didn't know we were young, that we were still having to deal with the, the police situation, the overseer situations, the, 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 the sense that if we were more in, moved around in numbers, we were deemed as, you know, as, as threatening and we would be stopped by the police. Um, and then on the other hand, you had these racist groups that would try to intimidate us, but we were a generation that fought. We were a generation that um, we stood up and we fought and cleared the streets, in fact, for the, our children so that they could walk in certain areas of London which were, um, you know, um, which were threatening um, to, to black people um, because of these groups and these kind of football, soccer hooligans that were roaming at the time and so on that created an atmosphere. And so we had to, and we had our music, that helped us. We had a reggae music coming through, uh, Rastafari. We had, well, even, in, even before my Rastafari, we had the Black Power Movement in the UK, which I was part of. I was kind of very radical when I was very young. That all of these things that gave us the strength, you know, here in Malcolm, um, the Black Panther Movement, we had the, you know, we had a Black Panther Movement in the UK. Um, and we had other organizations that were about resisting and so we, as a generation, were very clear about that we were not going to put up with the stuff that our parents put up with. And so we took a stand, and that translated into a number of incidences that happened, and that culminated into the 81, which was where, um, you know, we showed the whole system that we had power to disrupt and destroy if we do not get justice. And if we see just injustice and we fought the police and we were kind of clear about what we were doing. So, so all of those things came out of the injustice and discrimination and of a system which you've you know, rightly um, set out that was there to really destroy us. And, um, and because we had the music that was giving us the strength, that kind of really was important. And then, of course, they destroyed, you know, they then saw that and then tried to make moves to destabilize the music, which happened to where we are now. Very yeah. important point. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. Very important point about destabilizing music, and as you said, in general, just destabilizing the culture yeah. of black people. Yeah. Um, yeah. All I'm, over the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I wanted you to share a little bit with our listeners who might not be familiar either because um, they were young when it happened, too young when it happened, or not born at all. The yeah. New Cross Fire, which is a big yeah. part of your film, Blood I Go yeah. Run. Can you share a little bit about that incident? Yes. What happened that um, there was a birthday party um, on the, um, in February of you know, uh, one of the young, young girls and so on. And, and what happened is that... Um, um, somebody threw an incendiary device into the house of the party where all the young people were having to fun and so on and so forth. And, um, and the resulting of that is that um, 14 people lost their lives. Uh, people had to jump out windows because it started from the ground floor. So people couldn't actually come out of the front door. They had to actually jump to windows in order to those who survived, in order to in order to get out of the building. And so that um, uh, incident was the same had the same resonance as I guess 
the um, the bombings of the church in Alabama. It's Alabama? Yes. It's Birmingham, Alabama. Yes, sir. That you experienced in the U.S. That had such an impact on people. That, and, and so that event had an impact on us and our whole community. It was just like, it just hit our whole being. And, um, you know, and so, um, and the thing about it was that the, the police, we were clear that it was a racist attack, and the police then started to even uh, dismiss that claim, and then they started to interview people in the fire and had tried to kind of say that it was somebody inside, you know, somebody, some grievance, or somebody was angry that, you know, to that, you know, petrol bomb into, the, into our party and so on and so forth. Um, and, um, and created a, 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 a campaign that was what we felt uh, that made it worse for us because we were feeling this is a racist attack and this policeman is telling us something different and they're not making any attempts to actually investigate that side of it. Um, and then um, we're getting the press and then we're getting people like the prime minister who's not saying anything, yet there was a similar incident in Dublin with the IRA bombing and she was quick to kind of give condolences to the families of those who were caught up in the bombing in, in Ireland. And yet here we are on the mainland of Britain and young black people have been killed and nothing came from the, the, the um, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, uh, Prime Minister Thatcher at the time. No condolences or nothing. So we as a community felt alone, under attack. And so our response was to, you know, was to really... Um, you know, um, go forth and with the march and 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 uh, and so on. Yeah. Oh. Well, and I guess just the climate of the time. I looked at some of the footage. Uh, BBC actually has some really great footage uh, where they talk to some of the victims and other people of the time, and yeah. they seem to suggest that there was a climate with this sort of thing. Black people being attacked, attacked in a really blatant, racist manner. Um, yeah. Just okay. Can you can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, because incidents like this had not. It wasn't the first time that we've had people throw, um, um, think petrol bombs or things into a party in that area. So there were similar incidents, just that it didn't get to that level, and that the whole area in which it was in, which is a New Cross um, area, was known. You know, there was a National Front party um, in the area. There was it was known that you know. Um, you know, that they were doing, um, and they were active, let's say. And um, um, we just, uh, um, uh, and, and in that situation, um, and they were not just in that area, but obviously there were other incidences around the area. So the climate was very much of um, that we were not wanted. The climate was that um, we were under attack. Um, and that, um, you know, and you would have these marches where the National Front would be marching um, in numbers on the streets of England, and uh, they wouldn't be banned um, um, with their racist ideas. They would be allowed to march um, to, particularly to black areas as well. Um, and so all of this climate, all of this created a climate of, of, very, of anger. Um, you know, at the time. Um, and, of course, um, you know, we were very conscious of not just what was happening in the UK. We were conscious of what was happening in South Africa um, and so on. We could see all of that. So, 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 so that time, you know, because in South Africa, they were, you know, there was a lot of, you know, the same situations was going down and so on. Um, and, um, you know, on a bigger scale, of course. But so, so the, the, the climate in the 80s, um, was very, very, you know, um, we had a, you know, it was very intense. Very intense. Some of the room. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean. Yeah, yeah, no, it's gone. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was just going to ask as well, I know after the incident, you already shared that the enforcement officers, when this was investigated, that they really did not pursue, maybe this was a crime, maybe this was an act of racism and arson, uh, murdering these young black people. Um, also, I, I saw in the BBC footage that there were a lot of white people who apparently were making extremely racist remarks like, you know, right on, glad, wish we could have got more. Um, was that, was that also common? 
Well, it wasn't um, common in the sense of um, um, uh, I mean, certainly white people working. Because the thing about when you're looking at when you're looking at white people, we kind of you know you had there were white people who were fighting against racism, who were in solidarity. Very much like how, if you you know you compare compare that with the states, you had the civil rights movement, you had white folks and white people who were galvanized towards you know that whole movement, and we had in the UK we had organisations that were um, you know um, uh, what socialist organisations and and so on, um, socialist worker party, and you had people, and so there was it, it wasn't like there was. The, you know the whole the, you know, the whole of the working class people was against black people in the society. It wasn't that case. It was just that um, what happens is is that um, these situations bring out, um, as in the Stephen Lawrence in, incident, bring out the elements of the society which are often there to serve a purpose. In fact, because they have all they, they you know the, the racist organisations. Are so you know they are allowed to exist because they also play a role in this kind of white supremacy disorder destructive situation, and um, and they're not even aware of it, but they play also play a role in that. Um, so for um, so for us, it, 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 I mean, as, as you know, for as young people growing up, we wasn't so much worried about the National Front or those racist organisations, even though you know with those incidents that happened, we were more worried about. The, the police, because they were like what we call the, 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 the second line, um, or even the first line for us, because they're the ones that we always had to come up against. You know, the, the, you know, the National Front guys, they were like cowards. You know, they wouldn't confront us. You know, you're not happy. I mean, you've got the same situation here, I'm sure. But so, so for us, the police were the ones that really were the brunt of, um, of um, where we were facing as young people growing up. Um, not so much the the, you know, the the racist groups, you know, kind of would come in and do little things and go off, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't confront, you know, they wouldn't stand up and fight. Um, and so um, it was the police that, you know, were the ones that were beating us up in prison in prison cells, um, on the streets, and we were confronting um, continually. Um, you know, they come in and bust up our parties that we were having and stuff. You know, I mean, all of those things. Those are, you know, that's where we were feeling the intense um, um, pressure um, from, you know, from the police, um, really, at that time. Wow. Context of white supremacy. Again, our guest, Mr. Menelik Shabazz. Uh, my co-host, Justice, she's also here. I suspect she will have some questions as well. Uh, Justice, if you have some questions for Mr. Shabazz, your line should be open. Please proceed. Greetings, um, Mr. Shabazz. Uh -huh. Hi. Uh, what, are so what are some recent incidents of white supremacy in the UK that you, that you have seen? Sorry, I didn't hear that. What? What are some recent incidents of white supremacy in the UK that you have seen? Um, you see, white supremacy, you're talking about a system, isn't it? So it's every day. It's not an incident. It's an everyday situation. It's your TV, what you watch. It's your adverts. It's your... Um, it's the whole way in which the system functions in schools. It's, do you know what I'm saying? It's not a, it's a, it's a daily occurrence because the system is relentless. It is a system. It's a process that goes on every day for it to function. Um, you know, I saw it. Um, we, you know, the recent thing that came to mind was the whole thing with Whitney Houston, which struck me was very interesting that we had two channels, the mainstream channels, show a live um, funeral of Whitney Houston. Now, I don't know what people thought about it, but I was like, what's going on here? What, why are they, because they didn't do it for, I mean, Whitney Houston, what has she contributed to the black um, cause? What has she done? So, so here you have a situation where 
we've been shown four hours of a funeral with all these people, and the, and the main people that are put out there is the guy who's the head of the music industry, the, the white supremacist system, the music industry, is being lauded. And then you have the husband of Whitney Houston, the black man, who is being seen as the body. Then you've got the Jesus thing that is being put across, you know, the, you know, all of this whole thing. And I'm thinking, and I'm, and what struck me was, how were they, how were the leaders able to get two major TV stations, the BBC and the Sky Channel, which is owned by Rupert, Rudolph, Mur uh, Rupert Murdoch, very distinct organizations, but he, who have got their own programming, which would have, you know, they program weeks and months and uh, months ahead, and yet an intervention was made where they both uh, uh, make the same decision. Now, that don't happen every day. That, you know, some leaders, this is where the white supremacy power structure you're seeing is being coming in that can, that can make the BBC change its programming for a black woman whose contribution to our struggle has been zilch. She is known because she is a pop star. She's not known for anything else. James Brown died look a long ago. They didn't give him a state funeral. So why is it that we were given this situation? What was behind it? And so to me, that was the most glaring, to answer your point, um, example of how white supremacy's power the power structure, because we talk about what you're talking about. Those people at the very top, who who are driving all of these things, who are, who are educating their people to be to think a certain way, to program them, because it's all mind control programming that is going on, and what they're doing is um, mind controlling us through these situations. And so, for me, that was a kind of most blatant example of how that power structure can manipulate even the biggest channels and bring them in line with that agenda. So you then know who controls what. So that to me would be my example. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Um, do you talk directly to black people in the UK about, <clears throat> about, uh, about racism, white supremacy? If so, how do they function around you? I don't really talk about because you see, I don't really look at the, the white supremacy exists in our lives. But what we have to change it. We can always look at it and say, "Oh, this is a, you know, white, we know it exists. We know it's part of our lives. It continues and it's relentless." So the question is, what are we going to do about it? So I spend my time when I talk to um, people, especially when I do Q and, Q and A's around my film. I talk to people about self empowerment because we have the power as a people. We are the most powerful people on this planet, and so if we if we can believe that and activate on that basis, then we can shift things because nothing shifts without us. And so and so that to me is where I spend my time. I spend my time empowering us and get us to break off the mindset, a white supremacy mindset that's put in our minds to tell us that we can't do things, that we need to be negative, we need to be fighting each other, we need to be doing all the negative things that keeps the white supremacy system going. So my time is spent empowering young people, um, all people of different generations to say to us, listen, we need to take responsibility for our situations. We need to transform our situation as a people. We need to do that. We need to, we're seeing our young people destroying each other. We're seeing all of these things happening. And yet, what, what are we doing about it? You know what I mean? We, are, we don't seem to be able to, be, to transform our situation because the belief systems that we have are, have been um, influenced and um, 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 and I would say um, have been almost created by the by the, the the system that you're talking about, so that we now be, you know we become 
different. We become something else. We become individuals. We become someone that already cares for themselves. We become people that want to have all these individual material things and we're concerned about our material self. We don't have a sense of community. We don't have all those things that make us who we are. So, so that's kind of what I look at. I look at how do we transform our situation? Because they're always doing what they're going to be doing, but it's us because they know who we are. But the question is, do we know who we are? And unfortunately, in this time, we've lost our way. So that's where a lot of my energy goes towards uplifting us and, so, and given us the power within ourselves and collectively to, so that we can transform our situation. So that's what I do. Wow. Uh, okay. just, just as she'll have a, a few more questions uh, in a yeah. second, uh, I wanted to ask, since you, well, I wanted to say, number one, I thoroughly, I am so grateful for your response on Whitney Houston because I think that is, just an, a phenomenal illustration of how this works globally, where you can get yep. people all over the world to tune into That's the right. just, man, I hope people were paying attention to that response. Um, yep. Yep. Right. Um, Justice, if you have some other questions, proceed. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, what is the difference between independent uh, filmmaking and dependent filmmaking? <laughs> Dependent filmmaking in Hollywood is that you believe that the only way that I can, I say Hollywood or it, it, the same examples here, you know, trying to get into the BBC or trying to get the, the system, the very same system, when you try to get them um, or when you believe that the only way that you can progress is by going into the system that denies you that has never given you anything of that, that would empower you, but yet you believe that that is the only way forward. Um, whereas the independent uh, filmmakers are ones that empower themselves through their work and who, 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 who work from a place of um, empowerment or at least work from the point where they, they want to express a particular idea about their culture themselves, whatever. I mean, you know, it varies, but essentially the fact that they want to work independently, you know, I'm thinking of people like myself, I'm thinking like in the you know, US, you've got people like Heidi Gurima, Charles Burnett, um, as opposed to people like, say, Spike Lee, who is kind of very much a system person who, who doesn't function outside of, or mostly outside of trying to get his stuff through that system that has continually denied him. And, um, and so, so the independence is those who um, want to create an alternative, a different paradigm um, in their work. And the only way that they can do that often is by being in control of the ideas, um, in control of um, the vision of the piece. So, so, so the independent um, filmmakers, and in this time, I guess there's a lot of independent filmmakers, and not all of them have that view because a lot of independent filmmakers today don't have a consciousness of who they are. So even though they're independent, they don't function in the way what I call independent, which is have an independent view of vision. They function in that they're trying to get into Hollywood or trying to get into somewhere else, and they're kind of making these independent films as a kind of calling card. So I make a distinction even within that um, between those kinds of people who I see a lot because you know I used to run a film festival and um, get you know saw a lot of work and still in contact with a lot of you know the work that's out there. And um, and so you're finding that the mentality of filmmakers over the years have changed. Um, and so when I speak of independence, I just think I speak of those who have a vision, who are working towards an alternative or, um, or the real, because I, I don't like the word alternative because it suggests that there's something, you know, on the other side that is kind of mainstream. I think we are um, the mainstream. And I so thought the independent is really those who are working with the mainstream of um, our culture, 
um, our spirituality and our being and trying to project that into the cinema situation. So uh, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it does. <laughs> um, just in case the listeners don't know what the BFM um, International Film Festival is about, uh, can you tell us uh, what it is about? Okay. The BFM, um, first of all, BFM stands for Black Filmmaker. And it began as a, f- a magazine I used to produce um, called yeah, Black Filmmaker Magazine. And then out of that, we developed a film festival. And the festival came about because I um, realized that in the UK, we, um, we weren't seeing the films from the filmmakers that I was uh, familiar with, um, that I would go around the world with my films and see. You know, as I say, you had you know, filmmakers from Africa, Sam Ben, um, Diop. Um, you had uh, filmmakers from the U.S. I've mentioned Heidi Garima, Charles Burnett, um, uh, and the whole raft of filmmakers, um, filmmakers from Canada, filmmakers from the Caribbean, and whose work... Um, was not seen anywhere and that these were important works that have been made that are about that are about um, our identity was about who we are images that we, we that confirm our presence our reality on this planet there was nothing that um, was coming out of Hollywood that was doing anything to, um, or any of the BBC or any of the channels here, that was doing anything to enhance my being as an African person on this planet. And these filmmakers were doing that. And the, the, system, of, the system that is set up you know, you talk about the white supremacy system, does not want these filmmakers or these films to be seen anywhere. And so the, the BFM Festival was designed to bring the work of filmmakers that I knew, and um, not always that I knew, but film, the, the work of, 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 of independent films that asserted our identity. And so that's what the festival was about, bringing that, to life. Just the same way that you have in the U.S., you have now the Pan-African Film Festival doing that, um, and other festivals, which is about bringing our identity into the, um, into the, um, the minds of our audiences, people that had never seen these kinds of films, and that was the thing, and to create a appetite for these kinds of films um, and building audiences for these films. And that's kind of really what the, the festival was about. Uh, why did you choose to make a film about... Um, uh, okay, uh, why did you choose to make a film about those young black people that got killed in uh, 1981? I made a film because I am a type of filmmaker that responds to my instincts and my feelings. And at the time, I was concerned that here was a moment that happened to us that needed to be documented. Because one of the things that we don't do is that we don't have records of where we've been and what's happened to us so that our children or even us can look at, which is what we, you know, um, and, and so... You know, just like, you know, with the, with the, the, the white supremacy system, they're always, you know, certainly in the UK, they're always regurgitating films about the war and regurgitating and regurgitating and so on and so forth. Their history, all the Jewish people, they talk about their history. This is what we've done. This is what we've been through. And they keep pushing it forward and forward. And so, for me, it was, this was an important moment where I, as a filmmaker, had to, I felt impelled to document, to, to have a record that is there for generations so that now we can discuss it 30 years later after the event we're having discussion about it simply because it's on film. And so that to me 
is the reason why at that time I felt that I needed to have a record of this moment for uh, for, for future generations. And that's, that was always been um, something that was important to me. Um, and, um, and I also, during that time, I was part of a workshop that I created where we were about documenting our history. We would go out and interview people and, 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 and put stuff on, on film or on tape that was about keeping records of our story as a people. Uh, what, what were the ages of the 13 black people that were killed in New Cross, London during 1981 that, I, that you talk about in... I'm sorry? Okay. They were from it, 14 up until, I think, mid-20s. Because it was a birthday party for, I think, the, the person who, was, uh, who, who it was... Um, um, uh, I can't remember the name, it's the Ruddox, because it was a family of the Ruddox. Um, so, yeah, but the, to answer your point, the, the um, age range was, yeah, they were young. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> do you think the white people that murdered Stephen Lawrence are racist white supremacists? I think that they are racist. I think they are white supremacists. Uh, I think that they, um, they, but they are to me, um, uh, how do you explain? They are to me, because uh, a little bit more, the Stephen Lawrence situation is a little bit more than what people are seeing it. Some people, and I'm of the view, bec um, that it was a, it's actually a ritual killing. Because you had a number of things that didn't make sense in, the, in, the, in that evidence went missing. Um, people, the police wasn't there. It, there, there were certain, certain things that um, reminded me of, you know, when people are, are killed at, um, you know, you, you know that, I guess, through the Kennedy killing where, uh, you know, certain um, people were missing. You know that through 9-11 where certain things just wasn't in place. But with Stephen Lawrence's situation, there was a catalogue of things that was very strange in the way that it happened. Um, and the fact that you also had national newspaper, um, or, or rather that, uh, one of the, the, the sons of the, um, the racist was a gangster, a well-known gangster, big gangster, who was in league with the police. And so there's this whole level of, um, of interplay that happened around the killing, which suggests to me that, yes, there is, you know, they, you know these guys, um, are, are, we know uh, racist guys and so on and so forth, but to me they were primed, primed by higher situations. Um, so um, so I, I tend to look at things not just in terms of what is presented to us, but also reading between the lines of things. And, um, and so the, the, the um, so in as much as I see that the, the murders of Stephen Lawrence, and only two of them, the two or three of them have been actually um, in prison, there's two more that were there, that were part of it. Um, that, um, so the situation of the Stephen Lawrence, is, to me, is not over. Um, it still continues. And the fact that it's taken how many years to actually come to this point um, you know, um, tells me that there is some more, there, there are more elements to the story um, that, than, than meets the eye. Um, so in answer to your question, yes, um, I think that the young people who, were, who, were, who killed him were, were racist um, and um, and they were operating in the area, one of these areas, um, which was known for 
those kinds of attacks. Um, you know, it wasn't the first type of attack that happened in the area. Um, and um, and so, so yeah, so all of that is, is, is also needs to be brought into mind too. Do you think yeah. the... Uh um, do do you think the white people that murdered um, Stephen Lawrence should get neutralized? Should get what? Neutralized. Neutralized. Um, no. In the, when I say neutralized, no, I don't think I don't think like that. I think it's more because um, it's more it's more to it than that. You know what I mean? I don't because I don't believe that. It's just them alone in this situation. So I just think that um, 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 I just think that justice needs to be done, and I think that's kind of the you know the most I would see in that situation because um, those 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 people who are responsible for that they are going to get they they are already feeling it, and even the ones that are out there. They're feeding it because I'm the one that believes in the ancestors, and the ancestors have been working on this, and that they will not, even though, you know, they may walk. Some of them may walk free. They don't, and um, and so and even the ones in who in prison, they won't be able to sleep. They won't be able to. This has been with them all the time. They haven't escaped it. So there is um, so there there is certain laws of karma that is already being played out with them. And so I just think that we need to see these situations and wake up to the reality of our situation in this time and, um, and see these things as a way of, because I see a lot of our younger people, they don't even believe, you know, they, because in London and in the UK, there's a lot of interracial mixing going on here. You know, our children, a lot of them, you know, they have, you know, they may have, um, the, you know, um, you know, interracial white partners. They, they have grown up in a world where they think everything is okay. They're not growing up in a world where, you know, the black and white racism thing is alive in that sense. Do you know what I mean? They, you know, because Stephen Lawrence thing happened 20 years ago. Whenever, um, and um, so... So, so we're in a world where everybody thinks everything's all right. You know, you're seeing, you know, interracialism in England, in London. It's all very multicultural. So there's this, there's this sense that everything is okay. And so, um, so these incidents, um, wake, you know, hopefully will help to wake them up and to get people to see what is going on. But essentially the tide where things are going in this country with our younger people is that the only thing they're interested in is killing each other. And the only thing that they're interested in is, you know, it's all material things and stuff. And, you know, and they're not really looking at the, 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 the situation in the way that my generation did um, at this time. When I say um, neutralize, uh, I mean... Uh, not be able uh, to practice racism, uh, white supremacy anymore. Um, well, thank you for answering. Yeah, yeah you, white supremacy is not an individual. The individuals become products of it. But the white supremacy is a system, is what we're talking about earlier. And that system is in the TV. The TV teaches people, uh, white people, that they're superior. The education system teaches them that they're superior. The adverts on the, that you see walking on your streets where they're positioned and you're in positions of power. The buildings that you go into where they're in there. Even the church that you go into, a white man is there. So that's a system that's educating them and educating us to say that we're lesser than because we're not here, we're not on TV. Our children, when they sit on TV, when they watch the TV, they don't see themselves. They're seeing somebody else. So that's so. Therefore, they want to they want to to buy the dolls that are white or lighter that, than them because they're aspiring to be this thing. And so, so, so for me, the white supremacy is a system, 
and it's and that's kind of what we're dealing with. And so the products of the system are going to be racist in whatever parts of the world that we are. We're going to get white people um, who are going to feel that they are superior, they own the world, and that black people are nothing, and that depending on their education and their knowledge, you know, that they will either try to do it in that way, or they will do it in other ways. Because, you see, what happens is we kind of, it, it kind of also deflects us from the white supremacist system that's happening with the police, who are, you know, who are also part of that system. We're incarcerating our, our, our young people in prisons, the, the, you know, the court systems. All of these things are part of the system, which are worse because every day our young people are going into the court systems, and whether it's in America, whether it's here, and the court systems are giving us, our young people, a heavy time in prisons. That's where the real issues are. Because the ones with the Stephen Lawrence situations are isolated incidents in that they don't happen every day. You're not waking every day up in the press and you're seeing that situation happening. But what you're seeing every day is the uh, 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 young people going through the prisons, going through the mental institutions, being broken down systematically. That's what we're dealing with. And so, we, so, so, so it's important that we see that the difference between the, the, those who are manifesting it, because it's also manifested in teachers. Those same, um, you know, middle-class people, you know, the same attitudes that we're seeing with those young um, white races is also everywhere else in the society, just that it's not done in the same way. They're doing it in a different way. So, so that's what we have to look at it, and so that we don't necessarily see that those guys are like, you know, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the real representation of a white supremacist system. To me, they are just the fodder and the and the ones that are um, uh, that can also misguide us into thinking that this racism is an individual thing where you've got these guys who are just racist and, and they're doing their thing and, and, and you know and we need to fight these guys and do stuff to them and you know that is not gonna stop the system. That is not if we got rid of them, if you if you if you if you took all those guys who are responsible for them and just got rid of them, just fight them and took them off. That's not going to stop white supremacy because another set coming up. Do you know what I mean? That and that another set is is, it, is your judge, is your lawyers, is your teachers, is your prison guard. <laughs> you know what I mean? So so that so so that's where I look at things. Yeah. Uh, um. Uh. Do you think um the Lawrence's uh, killers are maintaining white supremacy by practicing racism on purpose? They practice racism because they're taught that it's mind control. They're mind controlled. So it's not it does it goes beyond just a thing of purpose. It's 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 um um it's 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 um it's in their system. That's what they've been taught. They've been taught to to be racist. Every white person in America is taught to be racist. Every white person in the world, in Europe, and everywhere are taught to be racist. Simply because the, what, they, what do they watch? What do they see of us? They see us as criminals. They see us, um, you know, you look at the news, any, any trouble that happens with uh, young black men um, or any situations with young black men, they say, this, they, you know, there's a script that's been played out, trouble. And that's the same script that you see in America. When you see black young men on TV, what do you see them? Do you see them doing anything positive? No. You see them doing destructive things. So, do you, so teaching the society that young black men are dangerous. That's a theme that is played out in the, in the UK. It's played out all through Europe, all through America. That's the theme where that, because the white supremacist system, that's what it's doing. And, um, and so, so that's what we're seeing played out. Um, you know, um, and so... Um, um, I've lost my track of your question. Um, I wandered off into various things. Um, uh, remind me your question again, just to. Hello? 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 H
Hello. Yeah, 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 I'm here. Yeah, we're um, yeah, we're yeah. Okay. Um. <clears throat> okay. Uh. So. Okay. So the question is. Um. Uh. Do you think that the Steve? Uh. Okay. Um. Do you, Do you think that the Lawrence's, uh, killers are maintaining um whites from C by by practicing racism yeah, right. on purpose? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I just answered yeah, the fact that you know oh. they uh there's a mind control up in um system. The white supremacy system is a mind controlled system. And so that's what we're dealing with. So they're not they're not they they've been born they've been programmed to think that way. Um and some people are programmed more than others. Um, okay. We, yeah. Okay. 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 Um, I do have more questions, but uh, I'm gonna save them for later. Um, uh, Gusta, you can go ahead. Context of white supremacy. Um, for folks who haven't been following the uh, two of the five white people that were suspected or thought to have killed Stephen Lawrence, um, two of them just were convicted uh, and sentenced to 14 and 15 years respectively. Um, what has been the climate, because that was within the last couple of weeks, what has been the climate of late in the UK? How have people been responding since the convictions? Well, um, general question. Um, people, I think for for black people, it's a lot of people are um, seeing it as justice has finally reared its head. Even though not all of them have been um, brought to, to to justice, but that the fact that after all these years, that finally two of them have actually received a sentence has a kind of is seen as a victory. Um, over these years, because um, um, you know, Mrs. Lawrence, she has been through, you know, hell and back. She has been her determination and strength over all these years has been a testament to her, and also a strength to our community to show that, um, you know, that you know we can do certain things. It doesn't, you know, you know, it justice may not happen at the time that we need it or the time when we feel it should happen, but with perseverance and so on and so forth, which is what she's shown, that things, certain things can happen. Although she wasn't in it alone, but she was a symbol of, of, of that um, determination. And so for a lot of our community, it, there's a sense that justice is being done um, at this time, um, really. Interesting. That their uh, conviction is on appeal. Um, I, I did see that. Um, but I guess, I, and you touched on this earlier, I think the important thing that should not be lost, and I believe they have admitted as such uh, some years ago when they had the uh, inquiry into the Stephen Lawrence, uh, the investigation and his murder, uh, and these were white people who made a decision and said, hey, we have a wide pattern of racism in this case, how it was followed, how the police investigated, um, yeah. way beyond the five people who committed the crime. Um, we would, right. This problem would have been handled, you know, in a much more efficient manner if yeah. it were not for widespread system of white supremacy yeah. racism. Yeah. Um, well, I, I certainly wanted to ask, and, and it would be great to get your thoughts given that you've done a whole film on what was happening with the Brixton riots, uh, 1981 and what have you. What were your observations around the rioting that happened this past summer around the murder of Mark Duggan? Um, my observation is that it's an, the circle has come around because 30 years earlier, we were um, doing um, similar things. The, um, and it was all sparked, and these situations are always sparked by injustice. Um, the, the, the riots in our time was based on injustice, P uh, police arresting and doing various things to people, and people just said no. Um, in this situation, Mark Duggan, he was shot and um, by a police officer and without being armed, and they were telling lies from the very beginning. And, um, and so people were upset with that, and that's really where it comes from. It comes from that place. 
Now, from that situation, as happened in 81, then, it, you know, we had riots all across the UK in 1981, in places where there weren't even black people. Um, and so the young white youths then, you know, because we're the leaders in all these situations, and that's what I wanted to, tra- you know, translate to people. We are the leaders. Whatever we do, other people will follow. And so that's another a situation where the real injustice happened, and then other people followed on top of that for whatever. And because we're not in a time where young people are politicized in the same way that we were, they will take that, their frustration and what they're feeling to a level. But at the same time, the police tactics at the time also should be taken into consideration that they allowed certain things to develop and they had their own agenda. So again, when we look at all these things, you know, the media, whenever the media is telling us, this is what we have to look at it, this is how we look at it, then we always have to draw back because, you know, it was clear from the, 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 um, the Tottenham situation, which where it all started, that the police were deliberately holding back and allowing people to do stuff. And so, um, so that created an environment, uh, you know, in itself. And then people, and then that's, and because you had, while that was going on, you had the top 10, no, top five senior police officers of London were gathered in South London watching everything on a screen. Because in London, especially, there are cameras everywhere. Everywhere you've got a camera. And so they're watching all of this happening on a screen. And so they've clearly ordered the police to stay back. So, so that's one of the aspects of this situation as well. There are other aspects to this situation um, that, that, you know, we are in, a, in a, a time when a lot of games and a lot of high-level stuff is being played out on us. And we are not aware of stuff and what's going on. And so, for me, the the, the um, what I looked at with the, the the situation happened here in um, the riots happened last year was uh, or the uprisings that happened. Um, don't like to write so much. The uprisings. It, it 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 was on the one hand a representation of the injustice, another layer where young people also are feeling very frustrated about the way the system is because the system in this country does not care and most of them don't care for young people. Doesn't put you know, they um, they only want young people to as fodder to go to fight at war and and, and die, um, which they've been doing from the eighteenth century. Um, they um, have no love for their young people in terms of how the society is set up. So there's a whole level of frustration that exists in the culture in the society that given a spark will um, will explode and so so I think those elements are, are there in the society definitely and um, you know but there's also a level of manipulation that was happening as well that we have to also bear in take into mind um, as well um, so that's kind of how I look at that much more so than it was in 81 81 they didn't expect it and since 81 They've been planning and been doing stuff so that anything like that happens, they know what to do. And so in this situation, they were in control of the situation, but decided not to be. That's kind of how I look at the situation. Because you had shots of fires of these buildings, man, and there's no fire engines. <laughs> buildings are just firing for hours and hours. They're just burning down, and nothing is happening. And you've been shown this on mainstream TV. You know what I'm saying? And it's like... You know why are we show what's going on here. So, so that's kind of you know my observations of it. Now, that to me is fascinating. Uh, particularly, you talking about the the manipulation that may have been happening during these so-called riot or you say uprisings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because here in the states, just why I, I tried to watch a lot of the BBC coverage, and we did quite a few programs. Uh, we had Dr. William Les Henry, uh, Henry on the program to talk about uh, what he had seen, and uh, I, I, there was a pattern of black people saying that they felt something suspicious was happening. Uh, some of the things that you pointed out, where buildings are burning and no one comes to put it out, uh, just invoking the name of Enoch Powell. I mean, I'm, I'm certain you remember uh, blatant racism being spewed and what he was all about. 
um, yeah. where he's now being played broadcast on the BBC News and people saying he was right. Uh, yeah. They had a black male on television. I played it at the beginning saying uh, he was ashamed to be black. Uh, it yeah. just seemed like an assault on black people. Like all of this yeah. stuff has happened and we're going to blame it on black people, even yeah. though they admitted there were more white people rioting than black people. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. But yeah, but that's the way, yeah, absolutely. But the system, that's what I'm saying. That system is structured to target in wherever there's a black person involved in a situation and a white person and whatever, they will go for the black person if it's, if it's to do with the negativity. It's, it's the same pattern um, that, that continues to be, um, you know. Um, and so the whole issue in, that was raised in the radios was, you know, you know, black people and you've got guys who were... Uh, you know, uh, black people was a problem again, young black men, um, and young black men and women. And so it kind of brought in all these debates from every, everywhere else of what they should do. And also, it then now brought in tougher measures, which is always a thing that you look at. Who benefits from that situation? And who benefited was the police and the, the system because it allows them for people to say, okay, now we're going to use CS gas on populations now. We didn't. You know, now we're going to use or oh, water cannons, and now people are going to agree with it. You know, it's the usual situation that has been recognised now, which is which is the problem solution scenario, which is what American foreign policy does, and well, not just American, the you know, the whole system, which is based on you create the problem, and then you in creating the problem people will then come to you and asking you to solve the problem. And so the solutions that you then bring will be, people will accept it, whereas previously they wouldn't. 9-11 was a classic example of that as well, where, you know, all these measures that were, came in after 9-11 wasn't possible before that, because people were saying, yes, we need to have security, we need to increase this, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to defend ourselves, we, you know, we just protect, you know, ourselves against these black men or whatever. So, so what it does, it creates a whole n a level, layer of control and opening of more control doors that wasn't possible before that. Mm. And that's because they're operating on a level now which is far more sophisticated than we've ever experienced. And that's not worse, and that's, then that's what we're not waking up to. That the system is operating on a level where they are, um, at this moment, they are working towards cloning, taking the essence of the black male, taking his soul, so that he becomes something completely different. The, the, the whole agenda of the system, white family system, is to, is to clone the black man, take his soul, experiment. They're doing all this stuff now, stuff that's happening. You see, why are certain people, you know, there's, there's just a lot more things that are, that are happening in front of our eyes that we just can't see because we're looking at things happening in this kind of black and white scenario that, you know, they're, you know, that they're coming at us and they're going to tell us that they're coming at us and they're going to tell us that, you know, they're going to do things that show that they're racist and all of that. They're not really operating on that level anymore. They're not operating on the level of racism. They're not operating on a level where, you know, um, you know, where I'd say where the Ku Klux Klan in your time or in our time where you got it. Those, all that is gone. What they're coming for now is your mind. Is your, you know, they, they, it's on a whole different, it's mind controlling. That's what they're doing. Taking off you who you are. So that you, you know, and, and, and without you even knowing it, that's the thing about what's going on here. The system is moved on now. And that's why we've got to play catch up and understand what is going on so that we can read between the lines. So that as you saw, we sort of witness thing and say, what's going on? So I'm saying that wasn't, they didn't come to us, you know, in a direct way to say this is who we are. They're coming behind other people and they're using us as well as part of it. So we're not in that situation of black and white because our enemy now has become our you know as Bob Marley say your, your, you know your worst enemy is your best friend that's what we're looking at these kind of times now where our own people have become mind controlled where they operate in the interest of the white supremacist system and they're the ones that's closest to you that's what
what we're dealing with in this time. Do you know what I mean? The whole paradigm has shifted now. Really. Um, you know, and that's kind of, um, and, that's, and that's why, you know, for me, I'm always just trying to get people to, you know, to look at things, look at situations. Don't just accept, you know, that things are the way that you see that they are. Do your research. Check out what they're doing. But at the same time, know that if anything that they're doing, if we know who we are, and if we connect with our ancestors, we connect with the spirit world, and we connect with who we are, we will change and transform all of that because our ancestors tell us what they're doing. Those of us who are able to tune into the, 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 the positive ancestors, they, they're telling us what they are doing. And they're also telling us what we must do because we also exist in a situation because of the whole religious system where we have become disconnected from our ancestors. And this is something that they've worked very hard to do. Because none of our generations before have been disconnected, so disconnected from their ancestors. And then you can track the de decline of our people with our disconnection with our ancestors. And so we have to, again, look at the paradigms of how we're living and what we're doing in this world and this time and know that we cannot exist in this world where we, one, are disconnected from our spiritual being, our heart, soul, who we are, because the whole vibration of the earth is shifting. So that, you know, um, and, and so there are a lot of things that are... Um, um, going on that we have to look at and so um, you know the, the, so to me the, at this moment in time the problem isn't the white supremacist system it's us because unless we do something we are just going to just lay down and just be cloned and they won't and become extinct there won't be no black man on this planet that's kind of that's where we're going down that road and we, we can't see it they're actually eliminating us. Our young, because they're dealing with the younger ones. They're killing the young, the young. All over the world, our young people are killing each other. If they're killing each other, where's the future? So that's what's going on. We are becoming extinct. That's what they're working towards. Taking, you know, get rid of us and replacing us with these clones. That's what we've got to be thinking about. And that's where we are now in this time, in 2012, going into the future. We are in a whole different... Um, a whole different paradigm of thinking and of being. Anyway, yes. I can go on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> it's in a lot more stuff yeah. on the spiritual front that I can talk about, which is very important for us to understand and our connection with our ancestors. And it's taken me a lot of time to actually figure all this out um, and, and, and to figure out, um, you know, and so, you know, what, and, um, how are we going to get out of this situation? What is it that we have to do to move forward out of this situation? Because we're now in a whole new paradigm. And, um, and that's kind of really where my focus is on. And that's about and, and knowing that we as African people are gold, we are platinum. We are the, we are the people that make this, this earth run because we are the healers. We are the people that bring the love to this earth. We are the people that bring, that take people forward on this earth. No matter what culture there are, they follow us. And we know that even just true, even, um, even, even in the music, anything that we create, everyone around the world gravitates towards it. So we are, so that tells us things. But again, the, the, the mind control system has, wants to deny you that and to tell you, no, 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 that's not, no, you can't be this, you can't be, you can't be greater than me, you can't be um, as great as you can be, you can't be gods and goddesses, you can only be a servant to the Lord, you can only be a servant with no ambition other than being a servant, and that's what it is. And that's when you see Whitney Houston, all these kind of things. It's all the same thing. It's that servant mentality that they're pushing on us. So, yeah. Wow. 
I'm going to... I'm going to make sure to ask you about uh, that servant mentality because I wanted to ask you about your thoughts about some of the more mainstream, quote unquote, U.S. films like The Help. But I, I wanted to ask, you talked about that spiritual disconnect that we have from our ancestors yeah. and yeah. how about a lot of the younger children, especially children that are the product of, quote unquote, interracial relationships. They seem yeah. confused. Do you yeah. think this increase in black people having sexual relationships and marrying white people, do you think that increase is contributing to the disconnection and confusion? It's, um, yes, it's contributing, but it's not the main, the main factor is our loss of self-esteem. The main factor is that we have no love for ourselves. These are all the things, because you see, once you start loving yourself and have self-esteem, then you don't want to be engaging with, you know what I mean, um, others necessarily. I mean, most white people have self-esteem in some ways, not all of them, because I don't think, I think it's a fallacy on one level, but on one level they have. And that self-esteem tells them, or Chinese people or whatever, that tells them, that I'm going to marry another Chinese person. Indian people, you know, all the other cultures of the world, they, they have a, a, you know, you know a self-esteem for their culture, for, you know, they have a language, and they want to marry their own. And so once you have a situation where you've got our young men, especially, who are going over, then that tells you that something is wrong, that there is a problem there. And that problem is a problem which is to say to do with self-esteem, loving of self, and that, um, and, and until we address that situation, that there will be more. So it's not just the ones that are doing it now, but think of the ones that's coming up, and the ones after them. That's what I'm talking about, the extinction of our race. It's just, you know, that's what we're dealing with at this moment in time. <laughs> you know? And so how do we, you know, so... How do, you know, what do we do to stop this? How are we going to be able to move forward? And it's about bringing that sense of love, that sense of self-esteem to our young people. And the problem we have, of course, is that our peer, their parents don't have it, don't know how to translate it. And so it's the whole education process that we have to go through in order to, um, to, to connect with who we are. Because first and foremost, we are fundamentally in denial of who we are. That is that we're African. That's a, that's a fundamental basis. Because if you deny that you're African, then psychologically you are in a place which is um, of denial and you will then accept, you will accept what somebody else is going to put in your mind. You get confused. I was interested the other day, I was, in a, I was uh, at an event, and there was this uh, woman from Jamaica. Well, she was born, her parents are from Jamaica. She was African, clearly. And she was in an argument with an Indian man. An Indian man was, told, was telling her and showing her about the Willie Lynch situation. And she was arguing with him. And she was coming from a place of denial. And so you had this bizarre situation where this Indian young man is telling her that she's African. <laughs> and so these are the kind of situations, the scenarios, that underline our state of disease, our psychological state. And so, um, and so it, it begins with the denial that you're an African person. And then that denial then builds and builds until we end up into mental situations and stuff. We, how we do, we go off and marry other people from other cultures and so on because essentially we, don't, we believe that these other people are better uh, and we've aspired and that, you know, than, than, than your own. No other race of people have that way of thinking except us because we were broken down. I mean, the slavery situation broke us down. And so we had to, you know, and so we're, we're still carrying that legacy in this time. Uh, in some environments, different to others, because in the UK, there's a different scenario going on here than, say, in America, where you've got, black, you've got things going on there, but it's a kind of much more clear-cut situation. It's the same in the Caribbean. It's much more clear-cut. In the UK, we've come here as, 
as migrants. We've come into a society uh, we move from where we came from, in the sense of the Caribbean, where it's very clear, and there's, you know, we're the majority, and so on. And um, um, but although that mind program is still going on in the Caribbean, as it is in America, because all the programs that people are watching are not of us. But because the majority of the people there are Africans, there is a level that things are carried out as opposed to here, you don't have, I mean, in the Caribbean, you don't have a white girl next door to you on your house or whatever. You don't have that the way that the UK, because the UK, we look at it as a gene pool of experimentation. It's a gene pool. Because nowhere else in the world, even in France and in Europe to some extent, but here in the UK, they deliberately put black and white people together. What? <laughs> <laughs> they don't in other know. words, you in a house, you can be in a house, and upstairs is a white person. Downstairs is you. So the proximity of people, you know, you're going to school, black and white, so everything is mixed up. And so what they're doing is, it's a deliberate policy. It's not, it's calculated. That's what I'm saying, that these people are calculating every move that they make. They're not going to let you just come into your, to the country as a black man and just impregnate the people then. Um, you know, like the Moors did in, 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 in Spain or in France and all of that. They're not going to let you do that unless they are in control of that because it's about genes. Our genes are the strongest. And so here is an experimental place because they're doing it amongst the poor, the working class people. There. That's what they're doing it amongst. So there's a whole thing going on here in this UK that, that, that people are not aware of. They want the integration, because even now, when you look at adver adverts now, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, it was a blonde-haired, blonde-haired, blonde -haired, blue eyed girl that was, was the aspiring model. Now it's, it's a kind of mixed race, um, looking person is what they now hold up. Oh, they're doing that here? I have a term for that, the racially ambiguous person. They have a lot of that where the person has a white parent and a not. Kareem Bailey Ray, she's an a, a, a entertainer over there. Doesn't she have a white parent and a non-white parent? Yeah. And she so, married so, Yes. Yeah. So here it's a, there's a gene pool that they're creating here. Um, because what they, what you what you, we uh, we a lot of us don't realize is that um, a lot the, the vibration of the earth the, the white people are dying and they're dying at a faster rate than we realize. A lot of people you know we don't realize they can't survive the vibration that's going. So they need to have they need to the gene pool needs to be rebalanced because they don't have that. You know, so um, they don't have the uh, the melanin content. They don't have the makeup that is going to allow them to to go, to go forward in the way that they would like. So they have to make these moves, and they've known that, and that's why they're doing it. So what will happen is is that in 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 next ten fifteen years, you know, certainly um, the the black male would become mixed. And then by two, four generations, he would have been gone out of the system. But they've got the genes. Wow. This is genetics. Eugenics, even. Wow. Eugenics, wow. Yeah. yeah. So I... that's what's going on here. Just that people can't see it. Because, they, you know, and they're, and they're sacrificing their working class women for that. Hmm. Because it ain't happening beyond that. It ain't happening in, you know, I mean, to the same degree as you go up and up the society, the pyramid. It's only happening at a certain level. Fascinating. Again, context of white supremacy. Pleasure to have him on the program, Mr. Menelik Shabazz. Um, I wanted to get justice questions. I had one more. I wanted to ask you, how are... Tyler Perry's films received in the UK. I'm sure they go global. How? how just your observations. How are his? How is his work perceived by Black people in the UK? Tyler Perry. Yes, sir. 
Uh, his work in the UK, most UK people embrace his work because it's stories about us. You know what I mean? They, they are pretty basic level, most people, in that we have so little programmed films that come over that, um, you know, that about us. Um, that, you know, so that they embrace. Um, you know, people don't really, you know, too much, you know, you are, if you like that stuff, I mean, the women particularly like the Tyler Perry films. The guys, I don't think too much are into that because they're not into that kind of genre of stuff. But I think, so, so there is um, an acceptance of his work and it's kind of um, blind acceptance. So it's, it, you know, so people, you know, uh, embrace it in that way. Uh, really, there isn't that much critical appraisal of his work in the same way that it's happening in the U.S. over here. No one comments about, hey, we, we are watching a black male in a dress. Maybe that's not correct. No one says anything about that? Not really, because there's no real debate process for that, because his films don't. See, his films are mainly pirated. They're not, because most of the films that we get over the U.K., because there, there's no distribution for his films in the U.S., in the U.K., really. So a lot of the times people get the film, they get it as pirates. So it, it, that, and so once it comes in in that way, it kind of really doesn't, doesn't create that much. You know, his films aren't going to the cinemas over here. So there isn't um, a level that, um, that people can relate to. Uh, so there isn't a level, what I'm saying is, um, where, of criticism, where, you know, on, on a level, like, for example, with Michael, went into the cinemas, sat out official on DVD, so people can debate it and talk about it and discuss it, because it's in the kind of official forums, whereas his work isn't. So there isn't that kind of debate going on. Mm, I see, I see. All righty. Uh, Justice, if you have some questions, proceed. Listeners, if you have any questions for Mr. Shabazz, if you're on the talk shoe line, star eight. If you're on the free HD line, star six. Justice, go ahead. Do you think white people are trying to kill all black people on the planet? Um, I think they're trying to kill most of them to their um, programs. They're trying to reduce the world population. And, and okay. African people and black people are seen as no longer useful. Okay. So, yes. Um, do you know, like, why you, you think that? Because, because, as I said, they, the population of the world, the planet, um, the people who run the world, the Illuminati uh, people, they see that the population of the world is too much and that they need to reduce it. So they have been doing that with AIDS, virus, all the different viruses that is coming on, creating wars and different things. So, they've been, so they, they have the agenda and they've been doing that. Um, and so their agenda is to reduce their population. And, um, and the first person that they want to get rid of is us because we're the only people that represent a real threat to them. When I say a threat to them, um, we are the ones that have the power, the spiritual powers, to move and to transform things on this planet. So we are the threat. And so the first people that are going to try and get rid of is us. And um, they are already doing experimentations and have been doing experimentations on us for a long time. Um, all over the world. And so, um, so the reason is, is that the population is, as I say, is too big and they need to reduce the, the, the population on the planet so that they can live on it and, and have complete control over the population. Um, and, but they also know that there's a shift happening in this world and the world is going to change and transform. And so they're, um, they're preparing... Um, uh, but well, let me not go down that road. But certainly, for, for your question, it's simply because they see that the population of the world is too much, too many people. So they have to get rid of people. So that's how that's how they're that's how they're working. They're not even thinking; they're working. That's 
that is in place already. And you'll see it as it goes on and on and on. And that is to do with the black population in America, that's to do with the black population in Africa, black population wherever they are, they have programs to deal with that. What suggestions can you offer to help eliminate racism, white supremacy as soon as possible? Black people come together. Black people come together. Africans come together. That is the only way that you can eradicate racism, simply because um, once you've got power, as you've seen, the Chinese have power. The, you know, there was racist attitudes and towards the Chinese um, for decades, um, and Japanese in America, for example. And now, those attitudes don't exist. I mean, people are prejudiced, but you know, racism, they're not practicing, the Americans can't practice racism against the Chinese. They can't practice racism against the Japanese because they have power. And that's what it comes down to. And the only way that you're going to stop anything, um, somebody else, you know, who's got their, you know, they've got, who's got their boot in your, in your behind, the only way you're going to do that is if you kind of show them that you've got the power to get it off and to, and, and to stand up. And so that's what we need to do. We need to come together. And that's the only way that we can stop this situation from going on and on and on. Because, you know, the, the, the white supremacist people ain't going to stop. They ain't going to say, oh, well, it's time to stop this. They're relentless, relentless. And as I said to you, their agenda is to wipe us off, to get rid of us. So it's, um, so um, for us, Unless we get rid of white supremacy, we won't exist as a race on this planet. That's kind of how serious we are now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you very much for um, answering my questions. Uh, you answered them. Um, yeah, uh, you answered them. Uh, and uh, I hope by that you can come back on the program. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gus, you can go ahead. Good. Uh, we had a listener uh, that had a question. Um, Mr. Asar, you're on the talk shoe line. Did you have a question for Mr. Menelik Shabazz? Yes. Um, I'd like to know, do they still use the term half-caste in uh, Britain right now? Not really, no. Is that no. a word? No. Uh, we say interracial. I, I, I lived there when I was younger. Yeah, yeah. No, we don't use that term anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we okay. use interracial, um, mixed parentage. Mm -hmm. Those are the terms that we use now. Mm -hmm. Half-caste is seen as a kind of derogatory word now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you were to say I'm that sensible. somebody, they wouldn't feel very happy. Could you? Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, well... I, I I took it that way. Um, I had a um, a nephew. My uncle um, had a um, a wife who was white, and they had a offspring, and mm -hmm. it, it was used um, commonplace. But um, yeah, it, it did seem to be a little bit uh, derogatory. Um, another yeah. question I wanted to quickly ask you: How sensible do you think it is for black people to to live in Europe in general? And um, um, in, in, in what ways are more the majority of black people are, are in England? Where are they coming from, and how are they getting there? How are they attaining their um, their um, their residency? Could you answer that? Are they marrying okay. um, or? Yeah, most the, the people that are coming here now are mainly people from Africa. So you've got a lot of people from Somalia, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, other parts of Africa have come here. Um, and they are actually more in numbers than the uh, African Caribbean population. Um, and uh, they are coming here via the, the policy that they have to allow a certain quota 
of people to come in. Um, I was always fascinated with the, because you have a high level of Somali people coming in. And it was kind of strange that the Somali people, a lot of them come in because they, at the time, they had no embassy because there was no war. There was a war, no war. Um, there was a war situation going on. And there was no embassy to even process any of this. And yet people were still coming in. And it was just like, oh, it's interesting. And of course, you've got also the Eastern Europeans that are coming in to, to balance against the black population that's coming in. Because you, you have to know that the, the quota of people that they allow in is, is obviously controlled and known. You know what I mean? Nothing that the, the Illuminati the system does is by chance. Um, so most people are coming in are coming in from the continent. Um, and of course a lot of people from the Caribbean are now have gone, you know, who would have come here have gone, you know, are now going to the States, um, where you guys are much more so um, than they are uh, over here. Um, so that's the situation. Um, would you in terms recommend of the, that they come? No, I don't. My, my, I don't think they are. Europe is not a place for us. This is not our place. We need the sun. Yeah. We are sun people. So I would recommend that people come here. But people come here as they go to the states and everywhere. They're coming from places which have been destabilized, um, and they're trying to get something which they feel is going to, you know, a better life. It's the same, you know, for my parents and so on. It's the same way people, just a different generation of people are coming in. Um, and I don't, you know, and I think, but, but everything has a positive and negative because on the one hand, the, you know, the, 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 the negative is the fact that um, we're coming into an environment that doesn't suit us and doesn't help us, um, but people are, are uh, able to use that to also assist their family wherever they are, as our parents did. Um, there's that side of it, um, you know. But it's um, the thing. The thing about here, though, is that you really believe the that. Right? Do you really believe that. No, not not here. That. Say. Hmm? Mm -hmm. No, I'm saying you so really the think the sending good. money to, to the Carib to, the, to Africa, sorry. to the Caribbean, wherever. We have a whole history of the people who come here, they all have to send back money to their families in, the, in wherever they are. So it's a kind of what we call an underground economy that has always existed. Uh, and it happens in the States, of course, isn't it? I mean, people come from Africa or come from places that have been destabilized are always sending money back as a way of, you know, but so how many that kind of economy. Nigeria, would you consider Nigeria destabilized, Somalia pretty much, but... Yeah, yeah, Nigeria is destabilized, um, and it's been more destabilized. As you, as you see coming up now, they're beginning to work on Nigeria, as you see. What they're doing is, is that they will, they will, they're going to, they, they mind control people and the experimentation. Who's, who, and what they do is that they go into these situations and create disorder. So, for example, in Nigeria, where they've had um, years of harmony between the Muslims and the Christians, um, components of the, of the culture, you, then you get people going into um, churches or mosques and blowing them up or shooting people. Now, these things are, are not acts that are normal to the situation. So what they're doing in Nigeria now, they're starting to ferment disorder. They already have disorder in Nigeria already from the top, but it's a different kind of disorder. I mean, I, I spent eight months in Nigeria. And um, so, so, so that... and. Um, that is in a, um, uh, yeah, a, a situation that is building, and as time goes on, you will see that that's going to escalate. Um, you know, uh, but fortunately, most of our people don't live in Europe. They don't live in America. They live on the continent, and so. Um, so, 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 in as much as we look at the situation in Europe, especially in England, where we have about two million, maybe no, under a million or so African people of both Caribbean and Africa, um, African people from the continent and from the Caribbean, those who were born here, maybe one, maybe maybe one and a half million. To these are still small numbers when we look at the big picture of our people. But the, but what can happen in the UK? 
And, the, and the, in, the, the thing about the UK, for our experience, is that coming to the UK, I have to say that I would not have been a filmmaker if I didn't come to the UK. I would not have been able to travel to Africa. I would not be able to do these things. I would not be able to have access to some of this knowledge inside the belly of the beast, um, which I had access to and our generation has. And so, um, so what, has, what has enabled us to do, um, and even like, even if you look at even the music, the reggae music started, came here, and we were the ones that enhanced it here, that then took it and grew it, and so that it went into somewhere else, and, and it grew and grew and grew. So when you look at the populations and the movement, there's always a positive and there's always a negative. Do you know what I'm saying? That, that in every situation. So you just have to draw from the positive aspects of that. Because I know a lot of people from here are buying up land and property in Africa. And this has come because they have also got links with people who, you know, because this has been a meeting point for us, meeting Africans from the continent, which we wouldn't have met if we were in the Caribbean. And so that then starts to break down the, 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 the divides that has been created by the Willie Lynch system and so on. So, so, so in that sense, it's, it, despite all the negatives, the, the positives is that we have then connected to Africa in a way that we wouldn't have done before. And people are, as I said, buying up land and property in Africa and moving forward in their lives. Um, and so, so those are the things that I look at, you know. Um, rather than just to say, well, the, the downside of it is, you know, you know, we can look at it and we can know what those are and we can talk about it all day, but that won't take us forward. What takes us forward is that how can we use whatever situation we're in to, to enhance where we want to go. What That's film projects are you, um, are you um, thinking about that will have like a mind control type of effect on black people? Like, like politically. The, the, the next project aware. I'm doing is a is actually a theatre piece, and it's a theatre piece. Um, I'm doing it because the film is going to take too long for me to try and do it, so I'm going to make it into a theatre piece, which I will bring into the states because it's actually a universal story. Um, with you know, and it's about a young man who is killed, and who is taken into the spirit world, where he meets his ancestors. He meets um, his great great his, his, um, his uh, great grandmother. He meets his um, um, his um, uh, his great 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 grandfather, who was a slave. He also meets the um, pharaohs, Tutankhamun, Akhenaten, Queen Nefertiti, and he also meets Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X. Martin Luther King, and this is a, and this is and this is and what the story is is about them sharing their wisdom, and much of the wisdom that I'm actually um, imparting in the play is actually based on real information that has come from the ancestral world of all of these. So it's going to be a very very um, highly charged situation in terms of what it is but what they what in that story of his journey and, and understanding he, he learns about who he is he learns about the past he learns about where we come from as a people what is our journey on this planet what we need to do he learns about what is happening he learns about the ancient pharaohs and Tutankhamun Akhenaten the struggles that they went through and how they and how they had to deal with the situations that they confronted um, because they were dealing with, um, uh, well, you have to see the play. But essentially, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a journey where we're uh, uh, showing people that we have to connect with our ancestors who are still alive in the spirit world, who are asking themselves, why are there people not connecting with them? Every other race of people connect with their ancestors, and yet we do not. And yet we think that we can move forward without us. You can't. And so it's sharing the wisdom of the ancestors, bringing it into the now, so that we can take, so we can have something to take us forward. And that's kind of really what, um, what I'm doing and intend to do in terms of uh, um, giving our people insights and also a foundation of who they are 
so that they can go forward, mind, body, spirit, and soul. Uh, 404 also had a call. Uh, thank you. I saw I wanted to make sure we got one of our other callers. 404, did you have a question for uh, Mr. Menelik Shabazz, 404? Yes. Uh, greetings to you, Gus, and greetings to Mr. Shabazz. May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Um, this, is a, this is a very interesting topic that he has on because I've been following on the news as he was speaking on with the religiosity that's going on on the continent as well as what's, what's going on, this ramped up heightened sense of religiousness, especially whenever there's a downturn in the economy, people tend to get heavily involved in religion. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing this conflict, especially with what's going on in Nigeria, which I've said several years ago, when the escalation happened in Iraq, I was telling them, I said, look for Nigeria to become next on the chopping block because of the oil situation over there, the U.S. gets most, most of our oil from Nigeria, and it's mm -hmm. a very large country, and they're going to start strife over there in order to create that division going on. And yep. I hate that my word has come back to me, um, has been fulfilled because now we are seeing this created Boko Haram, which is another front for the CIA that they've put in place in mm -hmm. order to create this distress over there and creating the sectarian violence between the Christians, the Muslims, that's as right. well as the indigenous religious tribes over there. And it's going to come in where they're going to do the same thing. They're going to split up the country into different sections like they did with the Sudan in order to make sure that the, the people who are more pliable will be in charge of the oil region. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's fun. Yep. Mm -hmm. it, um, yes. It, 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 and it's just amazing that if, if I can see it, and I'm not no, um, no, no biblical scholar or anything, and I can sit back and I can see what's being played, and people are so involved in, in their little nonsense, and they're not, they're not even able to see that they're being played. They're looking at this, the, the white man as being their benefactor, and these people are doing great, and they always throw this nonsense about, well, okay, well, black people are killing themselves. And I'm saying, well, we don't have any manufacturing plants that makes ammunition and guns and weapons of, of destruction. Right. It's mm -hmm. not coming from us. These people yeah. are bringing in these, these things in there, and they're given to these different tribal factions, and they're telling you to go fight against each other, because they want you to destroy each other, and because eventually the, the people who left standing will be the weakest link, and now they can dominate and control you. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. That's the game. And, and um, oh, yeah. Man. How is it going otherwise over there in the U.K.? Because I know it's very big over there with this so-called interracial, I don't like to use the word interracial sex. But I know it's really big in the in the UK where they like to push this racial harmony that everything is great, and if you get in bed with more white people and amalgamate yourself, that you're going to make this world a big happy place, which has been happening over two thousand years of this so-called jumping in and out of bed with white people. So mm -hmm. how is the situation going over there? Well, as I said before, we're moving into a situation where. I think they said that 50% of the young black males have a, um, another partner from another race. Um, so what we're moving towards is, is a situation where the black male is going to become extinct in a few generations. We're moving to a situation where, um, as I say, the, they're promoting, the system is promoting interracial um, 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 situations in the way that they're projecting, the, you know, the news stories, the, the image that they're projecting in the media of, of, you know, who you should aspire to. There, there are a number of things that they're doing at this moment in time, which is about um, assimilating the black male and black, um, uh, well, the black male in particular, into um, um, the interracial situations which will invariably mean that um, uh, they will, their children and their children after them will, less, will look less and less like them. And not only that, what's happening is, is that in these situations, uh, a lot of times when you've, you've gone into an interracial situation, if you break up with that partner, that partner takes control of your children. 
take control of your house if you have a house. And so you are left with nothing. And so th these are the kind of scenarios that are we're witnessing at this moment in time. You know, when you come to London, it's seen as a very, inter in, you know, very multicultural society. You go out and you go to the clubs, you go to everywhere. It's in everybody kind of apparently interweaving with each other. But at the top, it's completely different. At okay. the top, it's completely white. It doesn't go beyond a certain level. But as I said, here is a gene pool. And and that's the, the and that's what's happening at the moment. The the game plan that they started from when we came here in the 50s is is now coming to fruition. Um, so that in two or three generations, the black male will be extinct. That's well, kind of what they're working towards. They're trying to do it over here in the United States because. Every about you, you can pull up any website and you're going to see one of those dating sites is going to flash across your screen telling black women to go look to the white man as a partner or black yeah. men to go for white women as a partner. You cannot get on any website without one of those things as flashing across your site. Yeah. And yeah. You're, you're right about the pushing of making, trying to make the black man extinct because you're seeing it in all of the so-called videos, the rap videos, the way how it's always the, the woman with the long hair, the, yep. the so-called the, the right um, coloration, she's partner up with him as his love interest. You're seeing it in all of these so-called so so-called personal novellas or whatever it is that you call them. Who yep. you're partnering with, you're, you're not seeing any so-called black and black love match which um, earlier I got a chance to briefly hear your part where you were speaking about the Whitney Houston situation, which touched on that because here it is two, two black people that got together, found each other, they love each other, they, want to, they got married, and they did everything they can to split these people apart, push them apart yep. with all kinds of nonsense. Then she yep. still managed to hook up with another black man because she, she um, found another partner out there who she was associating with, this Brandy's brother, who was also black. So they want everything that they want. They want a successful black woman to go and find herself with a less successful white man in order for her to take her, her talents and her fortune and put it into white hands. That's how it's right. always, because they got the ball players already doing it. All of these so-called professional athletes, they always make sure that they partner them up with white women. Yeah. You know, they want to entertainment the same way, get the female entertainment, partner you up with white men. That's right. Absolutely. And that's, um, yep, that's what's going on. And as I say, we come back to Whitney's situation, and you see that Clive Davis is a man that is portrayed as the, is the, as the, um, the white sh uh, knight in shining armor. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, um, um, the uh, husband, what's his name, um, Bobby, Bobby Brown, is portrayed as someone who is um, the bad guy. Yes. Yeah. And um, you can't trust. So, this is, you know, so that's breaking down. You see, it's all breaking down our love and trust for each other. And replacing it with, you know, the Jesus image again. So that's kind of really what it is. Exactly. Um, th that's, um, so that's kind of what, you know, what, what's been played out. And I think now in the U.S., they realize that the, the Ku Klux Klan and the racism thing ain't going to work now for their new agenda. They must have stopped that. What they're dealing with now is that they need the gene. They need the black genes. Mm -hmm. We are the strongest genes. They need us. So now okay. it's about, you know, um, you know, um, you know, showing you have a black president, showing that, you know, that, um, it, it showing the black male and wo uh, man and woman that, you know, white people are all good in the sense that, or to, it's it's well, it's good now to look at interracialism now. 
Because in America for so long it's been about segregation. Now the game plan is obviously we have to bring, bring we need the genes, so we've got to create another agenda. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're doing. You know. you're, you're, you're exactly right, um, sir, because what it's seeing is that the white man is being referred to as the father, as you said in the, the situation with Clive Davis. He was her musical father and all of this foolishness. They were rhetoricing for him and the people like L.A. Reid and Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, who were all who wrote and produced her songs, they are being relegated to uncles, these black men. These are the men who have all the talent. They have more talent than Clive Davis. All Clive Davis right. produced was just funny. But these people are actually the writers, arrangers, and did all of her music for her, and they were mm -hmm. really getting the post of uncle. So right. it, it just goes to show how, you know, with black people and these things of, of always wanting to put the white man in the position of being God, Jesus, in the center of their life and That's whatever, right. and one man walks into a room, he kind of sucks up all of the energy, he's the center of attention, he's the whole total focus now. And yeah, right. people just lose their dog or mind because what I saw there was a display of people losing their mind because, oh, Clive Davis showed up here. Kevin Costner showed up there. Kevin Costner That's shouldn't right. have been here because Kevin Costner, right. he said in his own eulogy that he asked specifically for Whitney to be in his movie. Here it was, this girl, this young woman, was at the height of her career. She was the biggest seller. She was doing great for her career. His career was on the decline. And he's yeah. going to get her to put into a movie we're in a degrading movie as a black single parent with a filthy mouth begging this white man who's a bodyguard to screw her and say all of these nasty things to, to her. This is what he thought of her. And, yeah. I, and, and people are sitting up in there and they're not remembering what this movie was all about, what, how, how it played out. So why yeah. was he there? Why, why couldn't Denzel Washington, who played in The Preacher's Wife, or Courtney mm -hmm. B. Van, who played her husband in that role as The Preacher's Wife, that was more along the line of where she came out from, from the church, and her background, those people would have been better off to come up in there and speak on behalf of her from the Hollywood side. Not this case. Yeah, but then if they did, they wouldn't have got four hours on TV. This is just what I'm saying. This is why you're getting so many, you know, this, this whole performance was about. And that's the whole thing. You know, it, 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 it's about duping us and, and bringing us, destabilizing us yet again off where we should be going into this back into this, um, this 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 Jesus mode, you know, and that's what that was all about, you know, because um, Bobby Bob, Bobby can't, couldn't even get a a seat with his daughter, you know, but Kevin Cosner can get a seat. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, that's you know, and it people not seeing it. That's the thing about it. People are not really seeing the game that's been played over them. Do you know what I mean? And that's kind of, I think, the most disappointing. M M sir, even the program, the funeral program that, was, that I pulled up and I looked at it, they completely cut this man out of the program. This man was married to Whitney for 15 years and had a child. He was her ex-husband. Right. He was not even that's mentioned right. in any of the funeral program. That's the ultimate that's disrespect right. to the black man. Yeah, and that's what it's about. To say to, say to the black man, to say to the, the world that black man ain't nothing. You ain't nothing. You know, that's kind of what it's saying. That's the message. Yeah, you're right about it because everything was all about the white man from, from cutting the, the, the husband out of the picture, cutting her father, the black man, out of the picture by referring to a white yeah. man as a spiritual father, by that's taking right. her out on the shoulders of white men for her final um, departure. It was, uh -huh. you know, it was totally whitewashed for the whole funeral. Yeah, I mean, I didn't see all, because I just saw, uh, I think I saw Stevie Wonder, and then I saw um, a couple of people go up, and then when the preachers start to come on, that's when it, it kind of really, I couldn't take any more of it, because <laughs> it was just so clear to me, because I was asking the question, why is, this, why is this thing on four hours? I mean, who do they ever do that to? I mean, even some of the white artists, they never get that when they die. You know what I mean? It's like, what's going on here? A black woman, what is going on? Why are they doing this? It doesn't make any sense to me. They have to figure it out, figure out what is going on here. And that's, 
you know, um, you know, when you start to see how it's been played out, then it becomes clear what this is really all about and how the hands of powers can influence and move things around quickly. Because she died within what week ago, but less than a week ago, and and she and the, these powers were able to get all of the mainstream television channels around the world to come together, change their schedules, and put this on. I mean, it's a conflict. What I think that they were trying to do when Bobby Brown was left off the program on purpose, they thought they know the volatile nature of Bobby Brown. They thought this black man was going to show up and create a scene whereby they would have like a live action movie scene going on there with this black man coming up and cutting up a fool. And they didn't get that. Because Bobby controlled himself. He, you know, he, he said he, they moved him around. They wouldn't let him get to his daughter. And he just felt yeah. he didn't want to distract from it. He just left, he just left the funeral. So, but they were thinking yeah. he was going to come and create a big scene. And they were going to say, well, you see, just like I thought, here, this is this black man. He can't control himself. He has to come on this girl's funeral and just act a butt. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's the gameplay. Yeah. Um, thank you for for uh for the questions. Definitely appreciate it. And Asar, uh both of you all. Um we appreciated you taking some time out of your schedule, uh, Mr. Shabazz, to come in and share your thoughts. I uh I know we're about to wrap things up. I wanted to ask uh one more before we, we get ready to close things out. Um Wow, I'm trying to make my decision here. Um did you see, or I guess number one, are you aware of, of Peter Tatchell, white man in the UK? Yeah. Okay. Did you see he had an article uh, in the Daily Mail uh, paper? It was on Saturday, the day of the funeral, where he was alleging that Whitney Houston was gay and that mm-hmm. her true love was a black female. Did you see that post? No. I, I saw something. Somebody, I, flat, I flashed something on my Facebook. I think somebody flashed something, but I didn't really... Um, go into it really. All right. Do you have any thoughts about that coming out on the day that she uh, passes? Peter Tatchell writing something like that? Um, no, I mean it, it's again part of stuff. I don't know what that is about, and I don't give it strength and power in terms of energy. You know. <laughs> So I don't really kind of, you know, get into any of that because to me I look at a bigger picture and I see what the bigger picture is and then that, you know, because I try to spend a lot of time not focusing on on things that take away my energy because everything's about energy and what you do with it. And and often what you find, what I find is, is that I could spend a lot of time energy on things and you can go on and on. And those things don't do anything for you. They don't enhance you. They don't enhance your body, your mind, your spirit. And you kind of spend time doing it. So those are, those are subjects where I don't really spend a lot of time and energy thinking about or discussing. You know? I'd rather discuss something else that, you know, because when you do that also, you give it power. And that's what we have to be, we have to be aware of. When you discuss things and when, you, like when you're calling on Jesus or when you're calling on whatever negative or whatever, you're actually giving it more power than it deserves. And, um, and so that's, that's why I look at that situation. I don't want to give it any power because I don't want to discuss it really with, with, you know, about whether she is or whether she was, da 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 be it because he's not significant, really. You know what I mean? I don't want to give him any power by validating or not validating what he says. That's Understood. Understood. <laughs> Man. There's so many things to deal with in life. Absolutely. <laughs> we have a lot of problems. Um, I... Man, thoroughly enjoyed having you on the program. It was great to hear your views and to get more background information on why you uh, have created the films you have. Um, I hope people will make an effort to check out some of your films uh, if they weren't familiar with your work beforehand. Uh, Most recent one, uh, The Story of Lover's Rock, uh, about reggae music scene in uh, the U.K., uh, came out in 2011. Uh, And you said your your next work is actually going to be a play, correct? Yeah. Okay. 
Matt, yeah. Well, which is, uh, yeah, which I um, want to bring to the U.S. next year. Because I want it, I mean, a play is essentially a classical piece that I want to create that can be created by, performed by any actors anywhere in the world. Wow. It's not something that is about taking actors from here to do it over there. No, no, it's, it's a play that I want to tour the world where people locally take it up because all the issues that are in it are universal to us. Wow. Man. Because our ancestors are speaking to us, to the play, and they want to connect with us. So the play becomes a vehicle for us to have that in ex interchange with the world of our ancestors and ourselves, because they're, they're one and the same. Mm. And how we, can take, how we can take our power, can claim our power, reclaim our power, that's really what it is. Outstanding. I, I hope that uh, the play makes it here, and I wish you the yeah. best success uh, with that Thank effort. I uh, hope folks out there will check him out. Uh, Mr. Menelik Shabazz, thank you so much for sharing some of your Monday evening with us, sir. Okay, thank you. Sure, we'll be in touch. Have a good evening, okay. sir. Okay, one more. Good evening. Uh, yeah, good evening. Good evening. Context of white supremacy. Um, Glad folks were able to be patient. Um, had, as I said, phone difficulties at the beginning, but everything worked out all right. Um, we will be back, second program of the day, in about two hours and a half. Uh, we'll have uh, Cisco Street Love. He'll be making his third visit uh, to the program to talk more about what happened with Whitney Houston. Uh, he does a lot of research on pedophilia amongst white people, so he will probably have a tidbit or two to share about the recent school incident. I know he will, because he had paid attention to that as well. Uh, that'll be 8 p.m. this evening, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Again, Mr. Cisco Streetlove. Uh, Justice, did you have anything before we end the program? Uh, no, if you um, still want me to say the uh, buckets and buckets of words. <laughs> Uh, if you want to say it, we can wrap things up. All right. Um, Af uh, okay. Um, you are saying just buckets and buckets of words. <laughs> Context of white supremacy signing out. We'll do, the pa uh, we'll do the prayer the second time around. Thank you all for tuning in. Kyle signing out.